are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest in series of Ixian Partner Webinars. Uh, we welcome you to uh, this session, which is hosted today by Helen Fletcher from Equality Northeast. As with all our partner webinars, we will be undertaking a short survey at the end of the webinar just to see um, your feedback and if there's any further information that you would like um, to have post uh, the session from your supply chain or contract manager. Um, but what I'll do at this point is hand over to Helen Fletcher and hope you all enjoy the session. Thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm Helen from Equality North East and we've been around for quite a few years um, with regards to equality and diversity training. We've got the awards, we've got the website, which um, you'll have a link to later on. But the main bit is equality and diversity training, which we'll get down to straight away. So welcome everyone, as I say, to equality and diversity. Have a few ground rules. Respect each other's opinions if we happen to give them. Mobiles are for on silent. Use questions on the chat section to um, ask questions. Confidentiality. Park it if anyone has any um, questions, etc. We can put that in the questions chat section and we'll look at it for later. And I want you to have a bit of fun because I know E and D can be pretty dull. Aims of it, examine issues relating to equality and diversity, develop an understanding of equality terms and the objectives, define the meaning of E&D, identify which groups are most vulnerable to stereotyping, explain how these groups can or are discriminated against, apply the correct behaviour or language with colleagues and service users, be able to design an inclusive procurement process and recognise elements of the Equality Act 2010. It's not as hard as it sounds, honest. We are going to have a bit of fun. So, going back to the quiz, and thank you for those of you who returned it and for those of you who didn't, naughty people. But what we'll do is go through the quiz. Um, so I hope you've got the quiz there to support you with the um, answers. But first of all, we said which of these weren't a protected characteristic, and it's actually occupation. And that is the one that isn't. These are the protected characteristics. There's nine of them. Age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. Now remember those for later. When was the Equality Act effective from? It became law in October 2010 followed closely by the Public Sector Equality Duty in 2011. We'll come back to those a little bit later. Who does the equality law apply to? And it's actually everybody. And as I say, we've got the public sector section that is just for public sector bodies. Which of these were not discriminated, can be discriminated against on the grounds of the Equality Act? We had age, disability, mental health, religion or belief, gender, size, sexual orientation, marriage, single or race. Believe me, I'm not impressed with it being single either, but single isn't covered and neither is size. But size, there is a possibility if it's linked to disability because there was um, a case in Denmark, Netherlands, where someone took a case to European Courts of Human Rights because they said they'd been discriminated because of the size and because it was linked to a disability, it was found to be as such and they won the case. So it's very much on whether it's linked to a disability, but a singletons aren't covered. Is it true that everyone has to have an import quality policy? It's not only a requirement to have a policy, but if you don't have one and you get taken to a tribunal by your employer, then it may be looked on you unfavourably for not having one. So what does diversity mean? Right, okay. If there's anyone who would like to have a little bit of input here, we've got a chat screen where people can say what they think diversity means. So it would be good to have a few views from everyone. Um, 
please go ahead and put some ideas down. I'll give you a couple of seconds for that one. Get typing quick. So what do you think diversity means? Come on, get typing. <laughs> No, I've got no one wanting to help. <laughs> okay, what does diversity mean? It's a difference between, it's a difference. So diversity is about being different and recognizing that individuals do have differences and seeing and value their differences. So it can link to culture and it also links to equality as well which is, we'll come back to that one a little bit. What is discrimination? That was another question. It's been, it's treating someone less favorably than in other similar circumstances. Two types of discrimination. It's direct and indirect. Direct is less favorable treatment because of protected characteristic and it's usually intentional and indirect again it's a protected characteristic but is usually unintentional it could be a policy or procedure that's in place for example someone who is maybe Sikh and they have the beard because of their religious beliefs and if they wanted someone clean shaven on a reception desk that could be classed as indirect discrimination the hourly pay gap between men and women was 29% in 72, and what do you think it is now? Currently 18%, but as I say, research has shown that women managers are effectively working for free, that's it ladies, just free of funding two hours every day. So you can see how much of a difference the last 40 plus years have made. My company has an all-white workforce. In order to be more diverse, the legislation now allows me to advertise my jobs only to people from ethnic communities. True or false? There we are, false. <laughs> that took a bit of time. Positive action is legal, and that's what it would be classed as, providing you are advertising it for everyone. So you could say, we particularly look for um, vacancies from different ethnic communities, etc., because we've got, um, we're underrepresented in that workplace, in that group in the workplace. But positive discrimination would be actually employing someone because they have a protected characteristic and because you don't have any of that particular protected characteristic working in your workforce and they've not been given the job on merit, they've just been given it because the protected characteristic. Which of the following acts of parliament was not designed to protect people from discrimination? Sex Discrimination Act, Race Relations Act, Disability Discrimination Act, or the Hotel Proprietor Act, Hotel Proprietor Act. The other three are all now part of the Equality Act. What's the maximum award for discrimination claims? Be scared. There's no limit for discrimination claims. It's all very much on an individual basis. How much does an asylum seeker receive in benefit from the government? Very topical question. £36.95 per week. And they're not allowed to work while they're an asylum seeker. And that's all they can actually take up and once they're a refugee, class as a refugee, then they can actually work. I'll give you the answers for the next one. What percentage of the workforce their own parents make up? 49%. That's something to think about when you're looking at employing people, lone parents, you always want to think about how to retain people who um, become a lone parent or um, you want to get people in who's lone parents, etc. if you want to take positive action. There's lots of things you can do, like look at flexible working, work-life balance, childcare, um, vouchers and things like that. Uh, work-life balance in the workplace is important, flexible working allows it. Flexible working is available to everyone now. 
um, 2014, 13, it was, um, the actual legislation came into place and it changed so that everyone is allowed to apply for flexible working, but it's also got to be on the business case because it has to make sense in the workplace. An employee is harassed by a colleague and explains to you about you do nothing as an employer. Could you be held accountable if the employee took their case to tribunal? Yes, that would be vicarious liability. It's not a legal requirement to have an equality policy, but if you didn't have one, then this is where the courts could look on you unkindly because they'd think that mm, you're not really bothered about equality and diversity, you're not really bothered about how your workforce are treated, are they respected with, or treated with dignity. So making sure that um, staff are aware of equality policy, aware of equality and diversity, you do training, all that kind of thing put in place, then that would help in this kind of case. Which of the following is not an impact of inequality in the workplace? Low morale, increased productivity, prolonged sickness or absence, reduced productivity, obviously reduced productivity. Equality policy, which of these three, sorry, excuse me, which of these three, this is question 20, reasons for why you should have an equality policy. So it's to demonstrate commitment to employees in the law, provide an inclusive working environment, ensure all employees understand their rights and obligations. Going back to question 18, we will look at those two, 18 and 19, in a little while. In the meantime, I mentioned about diversity before and diversity and quality are very much linked to each other. So equality is about valuing all individuals and offering them a level playing field to reach their full potential in employment or to access a service at times, treating people differently in order to be fair. We get a lot of um, training through and we have one of the questions in the training is what, is what does equality mean? We define equality. And a lot of people will say it's about treating everyone the same, and it's not. It's about treating people differently as individuals, and at times you may have to treat them differently in order to be fairly. For example, you may have to cut away some distance for someone with a disability, or you may have to look at flexible working for people with children, etc. So it's about treating the individual as an individual. The Equality Act 2010, as we mentioned before, consolidated 119 pieces of legislation, as I mentioned previously, the Sex Discrimination Act, Race Relations Discrimination, Disability Discrimination Act, those are just a few. There was um, a whole tranche of discrimination legislation that was harmonised in the Equality Act, which is what it does, it aims to harmonise different types of discrimination legislation and has a unified approach to all protected characteristics which we have previously mentioned. The Public Sector Equality Duty, as part of the Equality Act 20, 2010, the main three parts, and this is the answer to um, question 18, is to eliminate lawful discrimination, harassment and victimisation, advance equality of opportunity between different groups, and foster good relationships between different groups. And that's something all public sectors also public sector organisations have to do from the police force to your local council. Part of the public sector equality duty, as I say, is to eliminate unlawful discrimination, etc. And we have the protected characteristics that have been mentioned, all nine of them. Those nine not only came about because of the discrimination acts that were already in place, but they came about because they can be some of the most vulnerable groups in society. For example, sexual orientation, gay people, peoples with disability, people from different countries, different ethnic, ethnic groups, etc. And because of this, we have stereotyping as well. So stereotyping is about making assumptions about people based on their characteristics. Stereotypes for a number of factors 
a lot of the time it's because of peer, media, etc. People that you don't even know, famous people can put ideas into your head about certain different groups. Um, however, if you treat people differently because of this, then that is discrimination and there's a typo. And it makes us ignore differences between individuals, therefore we think about things about people which might not be true. And again, this is something that can come about and can lead to, to say, discrimination, but can lead to prejudice. I mean, everyone, everyone is prejudiced. It's about making sure those prejudices, prejudices don't actually become discriminatory. The protected characteristics, as I said, we've got age, disability, gender, reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, race, religion, belief, sex, sexual orientation. You'd be staying lean in your sleep tonight. And as I say, these can lead to bullying, harassment, and eventually discrimination. There's the four main types of discrimination. We've already touched on direct, and I say basically direct discrimination is if A discriminates against B because of a protected characteristic or A treats B less favourably. So, for example, outright direct discrimination is not employing a female because you think she may be looking at having children or not employing a male as a nurse because you just don't think he's up to it. Discrimination by association, and that came about by a case where this young lady, Sharon Coleman, had a son um, who had a disability. And she was taking time off work to support her son and take him to hospital, etc. And eventually her employer sacked her because of this. And she took this to tribunal and she won because they said that she was sacked because she was associated with someone who had a disability and therefore discrimination by association came about. Discrimination by perception. Similarly, another case uh, came to tribunal. There was a guy who was uh, straight, friends with another gay guy, and he used to get jibes off people for being gay because he hung out with this gay guy. And eventually he did something similar. He took them to tribunal and he won because he was um, perceived to be gay when he was, wasn't just because he was friends with someone who was gay. And hence this came about. Indirect discrimination, as I say, we've actually touched on that one. But it's usually a policy or a criteria that's maybe hidden. You get it a lot in um, public sector because it's institutionalised a lot of the time, and, and people. It's just it's just been the way we do it here, and you know that that tends to happen from that. Equality analysis. This is the fun one. This is something where, um, as public sector bodies. We should be actually doing to carry out um, analysis of whether things, policies, procedures, etc., are actually working to the best potential. They're not having an adverse effect on someone who doesn't have, um, who has a protected characteristic, and making sure that they are doing what they should be doing. Now, this is answered to question 19 as well. So to consider if there are unintended consequences for some groups, consider if a policy would be fully effective for all target groups, and consider if a policy could be used to advance equality or foster good relations. With regard to question 19, which of these steps should be taken on completing an equality analysis? And we've got do nothing as there are no major changes, monitor the policy, publish the policy, adjust the policy, stop and remove the policy, or continue the policy. Now all of those could be relevant to an equality analysis policy depending on how you've actually carried out the analysis. It might be a case if there's no major changes, you don't have to do anything, but it's as long as you've actually recognised that you have to take action to make sure that protected characteristics aren't um, being treated unfairly or have an adverse effect on them. With a little bit of time, because uh, I expected a little bit more of interaction, but that's fine. What I'd like to touch on is the case studies. Now, there was only one person that did this case study, so thank you very much. And I shall name him because he was very good. And that was, who was it? Patrick Yan. So Patrick, if you're there, thank you very much for doing the case study. 
So what I'd like to do is just move on to that one. And if you've all got your case studies there, that would be fantastic. If not, it doesn't matter too much. The case studies that we discussed were um, bullying harassment. So the first one was, you're the human resources manager and, uh, and Julie, a new member of staff from accounts department, has come to see you in tears. She tells you that she's thinking of leaving the company as she cannot get on with a line manager who she believes is picking on her. Julie finds her line manager overbearing. The line manager is completely unaware of the employee's feelings. You do not want to lose Julie as she has potential. The line manager concerned is her high performer and you don't want to lose them either. What do you do? So, I think we had one little bit that we've got Patrick's there. Something like Python on the Feedback from Patrick on this one. Is the situation more likely to be an unintentional bullying or harassment? The solution would be to have an open meeting between the line manager and Julie in the presence of mediators to seek clarification of Julie's worries about the line manager. The meeting need to be may need to be minuted and recorded for future reference and action points set and monitored and the future means need to be set to monitor the situation. That's a really good answer. That's a little bit maybe formal. To try and keep it informal, it could be um, in the first sentence and explore with Julie exactly what her manager is doing and what she finds unacceptable. You could then decide whether there are grounds for you to investigate the behaviour of the line manager further or if there are grounds to start disciplinary proceedings. So I do look at the informal route first, but when it looks to disciplinary proceedings, going back to what Patrick said, this is where you need to record things and also have um, someone else there for the well, someone else there for the person who's being bullied and someone there for the person who the grievance is being taken against to make sure that's fair. Assuming there's not there is not um, an issue, and it's just a case of Julie having difficulties with her line manager style or approach, we should try to encourage Julie to talk to her line manager and explain how she's feeling. As Julie's a junior employee, it might be good practice to offer to facilitate such a meeting, which is what Patrick said, to ensure it does not get out of hand. Try to encourage Julie to think about how she would like to be, to be approached and to give it examples so that her line manager has an idea of what she's looking for. So what would we do? So the next one, you're the chief exec, this is vicarious liability, the chief exec of a organization. And a works party for an organized sorry, an work, organized works party for staff at the local pub. Next day, a member of staff told that she had been sexually propositioned by a male colleague. You told her that it's not your responsibility and it did not happen at work. Is this correct? Going back to question in the quiz. No. <laughs> in a nutshell. As an employee, sorry, as an employer, you have a responsibility to your staff and to ensure a safe working environment. Anything that involves work colleagues could result in being a work-related issue and therefore regulations come into it. What should happen? Should be investigated as any of the work process, as any other work issue in a formal process taken, for example, a grievance or a disciplinary. And what would you suggest for the outcome? But it makes a satisfactory one and for all involved and E&D training could be implemented the quality policy can be reviewed and ED become part of all team meetings. Welfare to work. A member of staff who has been with the organisation for many years and is one of your best colleagues has lost their partner, sorry, best workers and has lost their partner. They have been left with four children to care for, oh heck, for their own with no support. 
staff member wants to continue working for the organisation but may not be able to continue full time, how will you accommodate them? Flexible working, again, business needs, needs to take priority here. Could be working from home, could be flexi time, condensed hours. Patrick has suggested free time will be made available for the member of staff to adjust to new family working, family life under the Equality Act. Um, condensed hours, as you said, there's many different types of working time that you could put in place for the person. You could also look at how to having childcare on site or childcare vouchers, some organisations do that. Would you retain them? Well, hopefully if they're the best person for the job, then yes. But in real life, this doesn't, ha this doesn't happen. Some people will get rid of the person, unfortunately. But ideally, if you can retain them, then do so, because at the end of the day, it's a lot of money to replace a member of staff with regards to advertising, recruitment costs, etc. What adjustments could be made, if any? As above, as say we mentioned, the flexible working, working from home, etc. But you could actually get apprentice to actually support them as well. So someone, an apprentice or an admin support worker, something like that, to take a lot of the um, mundane tasks, if you like, or tasks that maybe needed to be done at work or the person could work at home instead. Ex-offenders, working with ex-offenders, every year 100,000 ex-offenders are released from prison, 76% of them don't have a job to go to, hence the re-offending. The organisation has funding to support offenders who are about to release on ex-offenders. There are some basic things to consider prior to engagement solutions put in place. For example, having enough money for a bus fare, turning up for work on a regular basis, being on time, accommodation if it's a hostel, will they need an exemption to stay out late to finish a late shift, help to get a bank account, knowing how, who to put down as referees on an application form, and obviously disclosure about their actual offence. Suggested outcomes for each of the above. Having enough money for bus fare, well, there's support from that job centre could support. There could be other places that you can get support from, for example, um, NEPAX, I think it's called, which is an organisation that helps people who are ex-offenders. Um, look at employability courses, turn up for work on, a, work on a regular basis, so employability courses, life skills, foundation skills. Have a mentor or a coach who can support them, or a buddy to support them out throughout the process. DBS, as I say, is an issue. We're assuming unspent, sorry, we're assuming spent convictions because unspent may impact on them getting the job to type, depend on the type of job. And there needs to be a reassure. The actual ex-offender, the person looking for the job, needs to be able to reassure the employer that they're not a risk and that their offender is in the past. The conviction is old and they can point this out. If the conviction is more recent, but events is much older, they can point this out too. It's about selling themselves to the organisation or potential organisation and making sure that they, they look as if they're actually going to be trustworthy and they actually mean to be there, they want to be there and they want to be part of the organisation and they really do want to work. Um, it might be that it could be an old offence, um, but it's still there. They could have done something as a teenager, um, which people do with stupid things as kids, so it could be something like that, and it's that to take into consideration. Um, obviously, if it's a financial organisation that we're looking for working for, and it's been a financial issue that they've been um, in, ta in jail for, then that's a different matter. Um, it's about trying to get them across and making a positive statement about sales, hence the bullying and um, support mechanism in place that's trying to support that person to sell themselves to you. Um, at the end of the day, 100,000 ex-offenders, and if we can get some of them into work, then that, as I say, is going to reduce the offending and reduce the crime rates, etc. So it's some just positive impact on about. Um, disclosure is always going to be an issue, but I think it's a case of being up front as, as best as they can, so ID at application. 
but it's making sure that they're not discriminated against because they can't be because of that. Um, and it's making sure that we get that we get that across to the people. So those are the case studies. Helen, could I just um, interject here? We've got a we've got a question come up from a Robert Red, a Robert Barlow, who's asked. I think it goes back to where we started, really, when we talked about groups of uh, those that could be discriminated against. And his question, Helen, is: Could you explain why an individual who is single can be charged more for car insurance than one who may be married or cohabiting? Surely this could be direct discrimination. So a different context, but very relevant. <laughs> So a single person being charged more for car insurance mm, than, than being well, married or cohabiting. Yeah, unfortunately that sort of comes outside the Equality Act. Um, and the similar with um, age as well. So anyone who is a younger driver, and that they're obviously hammered with regards to insurance, it's shocking. But unfortunately it comes outside of the Equality Act legislation. It's a different kind of legislation, that one. Um, similar with it, you've got the 1830s um, holidays, that hasn't been um, affected by the Equality Act either. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you Helen. Hopefully that answers your question, Robert. Really speaking, Joe. <laughs> hope you're there. Yes, I am. Um, yes. Right. Well, that's sort of me in a nutshell with regards to just touching on that because um, I don't want to drone on too much. I mean, I know we said an hour, but yep. there is an awful lot that I've said <laughs> and an awful lot that people need to take in. So I, I'm quite happy to for, sort of people to sit back and maybe digest that. And then come back and ask some questions if yeah, you want please, to do that. Please do. Let's let's use either the chat box or um, the question box. Obviously, if you use the question box, then I can feed these questions to Helen. So if we just uh, maybe take a few moments just for um, those that are attending. Uh, we have nearly 20 people attending at present, so I'm sure some of you must have some questions uh, for Helen. If so, please um, ask them in the next few moments and um, we'll just take a moment there to pause and uh, whilst you uh, write some questions. Thank you. Right, okay, doesn't appear that we have any questions, uh, further questions at this stage at the moment. Um, so perhaps if if we maybe conclude there, Helen, I'll let you wrap up. And um, um, obviously, as I say, there is a short survey at the end of this uh, webinar. If there are any further questions, um, obviously we'll be in a position to be able to put any of those to Helen if we're unable to answer those and obviously provide you with any further information that you would like uh, signposting to in terms of uh, equality and diversity. Um, so I'll let Helen close out and I'll thank you personally for taking part in the webinar and please do take part in the survey. And having said that, a question has just popped up into oh, the box. <laughs> Look at that. And it's Robert, Robert, our star, Robert Barlow, who has asked, I know of a young lady who works in retail. She has recently been diagnosed with ME. When she returned to work for lighter duties uh, only, as directed by her doctor, 
she was put on a 12 hour shift and lifting boxes about how could this be dealt with sounds harsh doesn't it um i'm pretty disgusted actually by that and that that oh gosh um okay let's have a think about this one first of all she should have had a back to work interview i don't know robert if this has happened um and I know that if you want to get in touch with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that's fine. Joel has my email address, etc. But first of all, she should have had a back-to-work interview with regards to her employer, and they should have put her on lighter duties. If she's got a doctor's note back as well to say that she's not supposed to be doing those kind of things, and she's informed her employer, then they actually could be in breach of um, contract, and it could be deemed disability discrimination um, because they're actually making her do those duties. And also, there's a borderline health and safety issue because if she's been asked to do those and what happens if she drops boxes etc um, the, the company could be leaving itself wide open with a lot of these things um, and also oh, something else that popped into my head again as well do you want just reread re the question back to me please yep I know of a young lady who works in retail she has only recently been diagnosed with ME when she returned to work for light duties only as directed by her doctor she was put on a 12-hour shift and lifting boxes about how could this be dealt with. And also, Robert, I think, answered the question when you asked whether she had had a return to work interview. He said that he confirmed, no, this has not happened. So it does sound obviously quite right. serious. That, uh, yeah, it does. Um, also, that, that was a thing I was wanting to say was, does she, is she a member of a union as well? Because the union will be able to help her big time. But it's, um, it's something that she needs to bring up with her employer and say, you know, this is a case of we should, I should have had a black, back to work interview. This is what my doctor said. And ideally, um, get her to take a, make a note of it when she's actually finished the meeting. And, and her employer or the line manager who she's meeting with should probably take some notes as well. And it should be recorded as part of a personnel stroke um, HR file. With regards to the 12 hours, I'd be interested to see what a contract says um, because that's just, again, it's just ridiculous. So at the end of the day, the borderline disability discrimination, she needs to take um, this to her employer, have a chat with them and sort of see where they want to go from there. But again, taking notes to make sure that she's covering herself and she's got a backup there if she does decide to go down the discriminatory route, i.e. tribunal. But as I say, Robert, if you want to get in touch with me and have a chat later on, that's fine. That's excellent, Helen. Thank you. And obviously, Robert, we can uh, we can supply you Helen's uh, details um, after the webinar. We have everyone's email addresses of who's obviously registered for the session. So we'll uh, we'll make sure. I'll, I'm I'll disgusted by it. Absolutely disgusted. <laughs> Great. And and um, Robert's came back, Helen, just to say thank you. That's uh, th thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, great. Okay, well, there's no more questions there, so I'll, I'll let you close, Helen, and, um, and after you've closed, I will um, close the webinar, and if you could take part in the survey, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, just a couple more things to go, and then you can get yourselves a flyer. Hopefully, we should have let these outcomes by now. Uh, I'm going to go off on that so you can actually see it. Get rid of me. Oh, yeah. Define the meaning of equality and diversity. We should have covered on them. Look at the identifying identifying the groups the most vulnerable in society. We've looked at protected characteristics. Explain how these groups can or are discriminated against. We've looked at those. Um, and we've looked at the different types of discrimination as well. Correct behaviour language with colleagues. So thinking about we've looked at the case studies and things like that and how to behave. We could touch a little bit more on that if someone wanted to do if we wanted to do this next time, look at that kind of thing. Um, a really good one, sorry, a little bit of a tangent here, is cultural and um, behaviour and how to sort of uh, behave in different cultures, whether you should shake hands, etc. or not. Really good one. I'll be able to design an inclusive procurement process. We've touched a little bit more on that one. That's your quality analysis so, as well. So it's looking at trying to ensure that EMD is part of that and also your public sector quality duties, making sure that procurement is part of that, your EMD policy, etc and recognise the elements of the Equality Act. We've touched on some of those, the different um, parts of the Act, for example, public sector quality duty, the legislation there, the different types of legislation that are now covered by the Equality Act, the different types of discrimination, 
and of course the protected characteristics. That's our website address, quality-na.co.uk. I'd also like to um, tell you a little bit about the Connecting to Change section on our website. There's a website address there as well, but if you just go out to our website and look for Connecting for Change CFC, that if you join that group, um, it's free to join, you'll get a little bit more information about legislation. We have a newsletter, e-newsletter, that goes out each week and it takes information from our website, news, events, etc., and that will help keep you up to date with changing legislation as well. Any questions? We've asked that one. But thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for logging in. And I hope the feedback's not too bad. This is my first time in a virgin when it comes to webinars, so there we go. I want to go home to an equality in, in reality to treat people equally means to treat people differently as individuals. So thank you and goodbye.